War II saw a wide variety of ship-mounted anti-aircraft systems which ranged massively in effectiveness and lethality. For reasons that should become fairly obvious, it's not possible, outside of the scope of a several hundred page book, to cover every single type of anti-aircraft gun and other anti-aircraft weapon system used, but we will look at the most commonly used anti-aircraft guns in the five largest navies involved in the conflict, so that is the US Navy, the Royal Navy, the Japanese Navy, the Kriegsmarine, and the Regia Marina, or Italian Navy. At some point in the future I might come back and look at some of the more obscure anti-aircraft weapon systems like the unrotated projectile launcher, as well as the systems equipped on some of the smaller navies such as the French, Russian and Dutch navies, but that, as I say, will be for a separate time. First, a word on the divisions of firepower. I've split the categories up as follows. Category 1, machine guns, which I've classified as weapons of anything up to around 15mm in calibre. Then 2, light anti-aircraft guns, this being anything from 16mm up to 30mm. Then 3, medium AA guns, 31mm to 75mm. And then heavy anti-aircraft guns, anything that's bigger than 75mm. Why this division? Some of the reasoning should be apparent as we go on, but briefly, my rough guide for making these divisions is as follows. Machine guns generally fire tracer, solid, and the occasional incendiary round, but they're generally too small to fit explosive warheads on the individual projectiles. The light anti-aircraft guns, which are typically the smallest weapons that you hear described as cannon, can have a small explosive tip to their shells, but the guns are characterised as generally short-range or close-range defence weapons only. Medium anti-aircraft guns are designed to reach out a bit further, ideally striking their targets before they release their bombs or torpedoes, as opposed to after, which machine guns and light anti-aircraft guns generally have to do. However, a medium anti-aircraft weapon is not usually the primary anti-aircraft gun on a ship, and unless the ships are in very close formation, they're still mainly for the defence of the ship they're mounted on only. Heavy anti-aircraft guns are generally the heaviest anti-aircraft weapons found on a ship. Sometimes dual-purpose versions would also be the primary armament of the ship itself, as in the case of many US destroyers equipped with a 5-inch 38. They were also large enough to have some effectiveness as anti-ship weapons, whether purposefully by design, or simply because they just had the range and firepower to do a significant amount of damage. As technology advanced, these weapons, at least in World War II, would also be the ones with the ammunition of a size that they could accept proximity and timed fuses. There were also some especially large guns that were primarily anti-surface weapons that theoretically had some kind of anti-aircraft capability. Various 6-inch guns and indeed the 8-inch guns on the county-class cruisers were supposed to have some form of anti-aircraft capacity, but as they're not primarily anti-aircraft guns, and frankly also they didn't really tend to work very well, I'm not including them in this analysis. The quest for the perfect anti-aircraft gun had to take into account a number of factors. Range, rate of fire, the impact of the projectile, the weight of the gun, the speed of traverse, the complexity of maintenance, and so on, to name just a few. A focus on certain factors usually meant that other factors suffered, and really all of those factors need to be covered which is why practically all World War II ships would have at least two, and often more, types of anti-aircraft armament. For example, a 50 caliber machine gun has a very high rate of fire, and is relatively light as anti-aircraft weapons go. It's fairly easy to maintain, and it's very quick to traverse and aim. But its range is limited to shooting at enemies who had actually pretty much made a specific effort to fly at or over the ship at point-blank range, and the individual 50 caliber rounds would be unlikely to cripple or destroy an aircraft. At the other end of the scale, some 6-inch guns, as mentioned earlier, were theoretically able to be used in an anti-aircraft role. They've obviously got fantastic range, and a single hit is no doubt going to completely destroy practically any aircraft, but their rate of fire would be much lower, 
their traverse speed is relatively slow, and of course the weight of a twin or triple six inch turret is huge, and so you wouldn't be able to fit too many of them even on the largest of ships. Further consideration beyond the gun itself needs to be given to the manner, frequency, and ease of reloading, the ammunition type and durability, and the complexity and functionality of the mountings used for the guns, as even the world's best anti-aircraft gun isn't much use if the mounting it's on has frozen up and it can only fire straight ahead when the enemy is attacking from the side. Equally, the world's most powerful anti-aircraft gun isn't particularly useful if you fire one round, miss, correct, and it then takes you longer to load and aim the gun than it does for the enemy to complete his attack run. So, with all that said, let's take a look at some anti-aircraft guns. We're going to skip machine guns for one major reason. Even by the start of the war in 1939, pretty much everyone had recognised that with the speed and durability of modern aircraft and the range at which they could drop their weapons, anti-aircraft machine guns were largely useless. Most ships had them removed in fairly short order, and those that kept them around for a while generally ended up simply confirming that they lack the range and hitting power to do anything substantial in all but the most unique of circumstances. Now, in doing this analysis, I've used a relatively rough but hopefully generally accurate way of analysing the various guns in question. In the three various categories, I've looked at the average rate of fire of each weapon, the weight of the individual shot or shell that they're firing, and thus putting the two together, the weight of fire per minute that a single gun can put out. I've also looked at the range, which obviously dictates how far out you can engage your enemy, and the muzzle velocity, which will dictate both how easy it is to aim, because a flatter trajectory is easier to correct for, and also how quickly those shells are going to reach out and hit the enemy. Now, when it comes to the average rate of fire, some guns have a theoretical max rate of fire, but they also have a practical rate of fire in terms of rounds per minute. And in those cases, I've taken the practical value, because it's all very well and good saying, well, in theory, we can fire X many rounds per minute, but that doesn't actually have any bearing on their ability to defend a ship if the practical rate of fire is, in fact, much lower. Where there are guns that have several different kinds of mountings and several different kinds of hoists or other forms of shell supply, which therefore yield multiple different rates of fire, I've taken an average of the rates of fire for the most common mountings. Obviously, for some guns, there is only really one mounting because they weren't particularly widely used. For other guns, such as the 5-inch 38, it comes in a whole slew of shapes, sizes, mountings, enclosed, open, twin, single, etc. And so, once again, in those circumstances, an average of the most common mountings practical rates of fire has been used. In each of the three divisions we're going to look at, a maximum and minimum for each individual category was taken, and the range of between those two worked out, and then each system was scored on a 0 to 10 scale based on an equation that was based on those values. So in every category there's a system that scores a 0 and there's a system that scores a 10 because obviously there is a maximum and a minimum. Additionally, scores of between 0 and 10 were given in categories of pro and con. This allows the particular strengths and weaknesses of any individual gun to be assessed and given a weighted value without having to come up with dozens of additional categories, most of which would be fairly static and boring. For example, usually a gun should not jam. So a gun that doesn't jam is just, well, that's normal. But a gun that actually jams a lot, that needs to be marked down. So that would go in a con. Um, whereas perhaps a gun that is very, very powerful in its individual impacts might be well above the mark in compared to most of the other sh shells that are under consideration in this particular uh, division. But again, 
the others might be fairly effective, it's just this one is spectacularly effective. So to avoid just having to put vanilla values in for most of the guns and then just one higher score in a particular category, that would just go into pro. Then all the pros and all the cons can be added up and it can be assessed, well, at least by me, are these pros significant in terms of the overall operation of the gun or are they not particularly significant? Um, in, and that's both pros and cons. All of that then averaged out gives an overall score, and it's that score that I've used to determine the position of each gun in each of the divisions that we're going to look at. So, with all that explanation done, let's move on to light caliber anti aircraft weapons. And in each categorization, we'll go from worst to best. So, there were five weapons considered for light anti aircraft guns. And the worst of them actually is the Italian 20mm 65 caliber anti-aircraft weapon. This really has quite poor characteristics. Its weight of fire per minute is by far the lowest. Its range is just the lowest. Its rate of fire really isn't that impressive either. And when it comes to its muzzle velocity, it is slightly below average. In its favour, it's a fairly efficient and fairly accurate weapon if an aircraft actually bothers to come close enough. On the other hand, with that short range, low rate of fire and a fairly small magazine capacity, you're going to still have to be pretty sharp on your toes to actually hit anything. And so with an overall score of 2.6 out of 10, the Italian 20mm is right at the bottom of the pile. Next up, with a score of an exact 4, is the American 1.1 inch gun, or 28mm, also known as the Chicago Piano. It's got the worst rate of fire of all of the weapons under consideration, with around about 100 rounds per minute. Its muzzle velocity is by far the worst. However, the overall weight of fire and the range are both top of the categories because, well, it's also the largest weapon by caliber under consideration in the light AA category. So what makes it the second worst gun? Well, its only real pro is that, as you might imagine from having the heaviest weight of fire um, of any given weapon, the individual hits from a 28mm shell are quite effective at um, hit, uh, taking out enemy aircraft. However, when it was more typically used in its quad mounting, it had excessive vibration issues. And of course, you're not going to do any damage to aircraft you don't hit. And it proved to be very unreliable in action. And that made it a pretty poor weapon overall. As I say, if you hit something with it, then there was a fairly good chance it was going to feel it but the chances of you actually hitting anything were relatively little. Um, so for, that re for those reasons, it doesn't score particularly highly, and it was replaced fairly quickly when uh, the US Navy could afford to. Next, in the middle of the pack, is the Japanese 25mm 60 caliber gun. You might be thinking, what the heck is it doing in the middle of the pack? Surely it's an awful weapon. And, well, in terms of its rate of fire, yeah, it is pretty awful. Its average rate of fire is not all that much more than the 1.1 inch. It's got a decent weight of fire, about middle of the pack, because of the 25mm shell. And it's actually got fairly decent range and a top-of-end muzzle velocity for light anti-aircraft weapons. And good range, good muzzle velocity, those are pros. Why, though... It, has it got such a bad reputation? Well, several reasons. The low rate of fire doesn't help matters. It jammed an awful lot. It was very difficult to reload in action compared to some other systems. It had very basic mounts. For a light anti-aircraft weapon, it was very slow to train. The sighting systems were awful. Um, in many cases, not actually able to track modern high-speed aircraft. And, like the 1.1 inch, it suffered from significant vibration problems. So, with an overall score of 4.4, the Japanese 25mm-60 caliber weapon is only just higher 
than the 1.1 inch. The reason why the 25 millimeter gets so much stick is that the 1.1 inch, as we said, was fairly quickly replaced in service. The Japanese 25 millimeter wasn't. It stuck around longer and longer and longer, all the way through to the end of the war, and thus as aircraft capabilities improved, its deficiencies became more and more and more obvious, which really didn't help it. The other factor, as we'll come on to a bit later, is that Japan didn't have a medium anti-aircraft weapon. They only had a 25mm and then it was onto the heavy AA. So the 25mm was not only competing with things like the 1.1 inch, the Orlikan 20mm, etc. It was also competing with the Pom Pom, the Bofors, 37mm from various countries, etc. And it's a not particularly brilliant light AA weapon with a lot of issues, but when it's having to pull double duty substituting in for heavy stuff as well as lighter stuff, it really, really doesn't compete. And that's why it gets so much stick. There is nothing that the Japanese can really use in any significant quantity below a 75mm calibre. And as you heard, it also had a laundry list of issues that significantly mitigated against its few strengths. Because again, yeah, it's got the range, yeah, it's got the muzzle velocity, but if you're having problems actually reloading the thing to fire, or you can't actually track the aircraft that you're aiming at, that doesn't make the blindest bit of difference, because shells on target are what actually kill aircraft. Then, with a score of 4.7, we have the German 20mm C38. This has a pretty decent rate of fire, um, almost double that of pretty much any other weapon that we've considered so far. It's got a middling uh, rate of weight per fire per minute, because um, although it's a 20mm weapon with a relatively light projectile, it is firing an awful lot of them. The range and muzzle velocity aren't all that much to write home about, but it does come with a stabilised mounting and in some forms an extended magazine, which are fairly good pros. The cons are that it does have a slower rate of fire than the winner of this particular category, um, and this upper rate of fire does reflect an improved version of the 20mm C38. The original version w would have scored a little bit lower on the list. But, and that's the German 20mm. And the winner, by a clear, clear margin, with an overall score of 6.7, is the 20mm Orlikan, which shouldn't come as much of a surprise to most people, uh, used most commonly by the USA and the UK on its various ships. It has the highest rate of fire by a fair bit at 300 rounds per minute average rate of fire. The weight of shot being a 20mm round not particularly great, but because of that massive rate of fire, even with a fairly, fairly light shell, its weight of fire per minute is well up there and competitive. The range is the only true weakness. At um, about 3,000 metres range, it doesn't compare too favourably with most of the other guns, but it's a relatively minor thing for a close range defence weapon, which has medium uh, calibre anti aircraft weapons there to help. The muzzle velocity is on av about average for this category. In terms of its pros, it's very easy to maintain and it's very easy to use, which increases effectiveness. Um, the only real cons are that. The very earliest models of the 20mm were somewhat finicky and complex. It hadn't really been designed for mass production, and it also was designed originally in metric. But once it had been converted over and entered mass production, it proved to be quite the easy gun to manufacture. It did need to be a bit simplified, but the simplified mass manufacture model is the one that's the most common, and therefore the one that is going to be analysed here. The only other con was that by the end of the war, as with pretty much almost any light anti-aircraft gun, it really didn't have the firepower to stop enemy aircraft, especially kamikazes, which being a primarily US and UK deployed weapon, it had to face off against. But 
those are relatively minor issues compared to some of the major problems facing some of the other guns in this category. And so with the overall score of 6.7, the 20mm Orlikon is the best light anti-aircraft weapon. The medium anti-aircraft gun category is theoretically a slightly smaller one because Japan doesn't have an entry. <laughs> Unfortunately, it actually ends up being one larger because the Germans, in their infinite wisdom, ended up with three relatively commonly used variants of the 37mm gun with wildly different performance characteristics which require them to be independently assessed. And two of those 37mm guns occupy the bottom two slots here. Uh, at the absolute bottom, uh, with a score of 2.9, the German 37mm-69 M42 gun, and its predecessor, actually scoring slightly higher in this particular category, the 37mm-83 C30 weapon, with a score of 4.5. The M42 has a fairly low rate of fire, um, a very low weight of shot, and as a result a very poor overall weight of fire per minute. Its range is pretty poor for the uh, overall category, although not the worst, and it's got a middling muzzle velocity. The pros of it are largely that it has a better rate of fire than the C30 model, and it also comes with a gun shield, which helps. But against that, the rate of fire is still pretty awful, and the low total throw weight means that there isn't all that many 37mm shells out there if you're using this to defend your ship. The older C30 model has an even worse rate of fire of only 30 rounds per minute, because this is basically a semi-automatic weapon that has to be reloaded every single time you fire. The weight of shot, again, is still not fantastic, and thus the weight of fire is per minute is the lowest of any of the guns in this overall categorization. With an 83 caliber length barrel, it does, however, have a fantastic muzzle velocity and range, which is also its only real strength, but the abysmal rate of fire and the fact that the mountings keep seizing up and stopping working means that it's really an absolutely awful AA weapon, the only real reason that it scores higher than its successor, the M42, is because with that range and muzzle velocity, you do have a reasonable amount of time to actually fire your relatively few shells at an incoming aircraft, assuming that your mounting is actually functional. Um, but if you weight range and muzzle velocity slightly less, it would drop to the bottom of the categories. Then, the next three weapons are pretty much lodged in a three-way tie at around 5.5 out of 10. These three entries are the German 37mm 57 caliber M43 gun, the Italian 37mm-54 gun, and the UK's 40mm pom-pom using the high-velocity rounds. The Italian 37mm gun has a decent rate of fire, decent weight of shot, a pretty good overall thus weight of fire per minute, but its range and muzzle velocity are towards the lower end of the pack. It does have a fairly consistent rate of fire, it's a stabilised gun, and it's pretty accurate, which are good. Its only real con is vibration issues affect that accuracy quite considerably um, once it's up to full rate of fire. So, yeah, overall a pretty solid weapon. The German 37mm 57 caliber M43 has the highest rate of fire um, by a considerable margin over everybody else, um, with an average rate of fire of about 180 rounds a minute. It does, however, fire a one of the if not the lightest shell of any of the guns in this category and its weight weight of fire per minute is actually still top of the class because despite the low weight there's just so many of them going out its range however largely because of that light shell is not particularly great towards the bottom end of things and its muzzle velocity is middling that Insane rate of fire is pretty much the main strength of the weapon, um, but it still only has manual training, uh, 
despite the fact that, as the M43 categorization might suggest, it's actually a late war gun. So a number of significant strengths, but uh, also a number of fairly noticeable weaknesses. Then we come to the 40mm pom-pom, which, it, for all that it gets derided, it should be noted, it did come relatively close to beating out the 40mm Bofors in a US Navy competition for medium anti-aircraft weapons. Its average rate of fire is relatively good, about mid of, middle of the pack. The individual rounds, as 40mm rounds, are amongst the heaviest, and between a decent rate of fire and a fairly heavy weight of shot, it's actually close to the German 37mm M43 in terms of overall weight of fire that can be put out per minute. However, its range and muzzle velocity are both at the very bottom of the medium AA category. The strengths that it has are that, well, you can get it in an octuple mounting, um, which is great for just exploiting that weight of fire per minute to throw a truly hilarious amount of shot down a particular fire lane. It also has a very high sustained rate of fire thanks to some very extensive magazines compared to um, many of the other weapons. Indeed, it, in many mountings it is actually belt fed. And with the quadruple and octuple mountings it has a very very good concentration of fire. This would serve it fairly well in the late war when kamikazes were a major problem because it turned out that if you could fire an octuple mounting down range with that hilarious amount of uh, shell going down range you could pretty much erode a kamikaze in many cases where maybe single twin or other quad mountings of other guns perhaps couldn't the high sustained rate of fire could also be maintained in some of the heavier mountings especially the octuple ones by only firing off some of the barrels. So if you fired off any given four using your extended feed of ammunition, by the time they were out, you could just switch over to the other four and keep firing whilst the first four were reloaded. And this was actually another fairly significant strength of the 40mm pom-pom, as it meant that when an attack actually came in, the 40mm pom-pom could continue firing for pretty much the entire duration of that attack without interruption. However, balancing out that list of superlatives comes a relatively long list of negatives. As I said before, it's got the lowest muzzle velocity, as it's very much an older weapon and based on a still older gun, even with the higher velocity rounds. The multiple mountings, whilst they do have, again, have all those strengths, were fairly heavy overall which meant you could have fewer of them which means you could engage fewer targets that wasn't so much of an issue early on but as air attacks became more and more um, numerous and they began targeting anti-aircraft mounts it became a little bit of an issue there were also certain limitations on the ammunition for example there wasn't a trace around for a good portion of the war which actually is fairly important both in terms of helping to aim but also in terms of the effect on aircrew as it was found that a relatively steady stream of tracer fire even if you didn't hit as long as you came relatively close could force most pilots unless they were kamikazes or similar to break off because it made them very nervous um, seeing these uh, very brightly colored flashes coming towards you and gradually tracking in closer whereas if you didn't see the incoming ammunition, then you really had no idea that you were being shot at, and therefore you'd probably just continue your attack run unless and until something actually hit you. There were also a number of issues early on in the war with the ammunition supply itself. Uh, during the attack on Force Z, for example, famously, a number of pom-poms jammed or were unable to fire because of the ammunition belts not working or the ammunition itself falling apart in the tropical heat. Whilst this would be rectified, that didn't really help Prince of Wales or Repulse all that much. And sitting atop the tree of the medium calibre anti-aircraft weapon, again probably not really that much of a surprise, the 40mm Bofors gun, used primarily again by the US Navy and the Royal Navy, although it did also see service in a number of other navies on both sides. This weapon doesn't have the world's 
best rate of fire compared to some of the other weapons in this category, um, but it's still middle of the pack. The actual shell, however, is the heaviest, and thus the weight of fire per minute is significantly above average, even if it's not the best. The range, however, is absolute top of the pack, and in medium anti-aircraft guns this does actually start to have a lot more of an effect, especially later in the war, in order to allow the 40mm to retain its ability to kill aircraft before they get into weapons drop range. Although, towards the end of the war, pretty much all the medium anti-aircraft weapons had had this ability removed to a certain extent by certain weapon systems such as the Fritz X. Its muzzle velocity is also decent, slightly above average, and so collectively, added together with the pros of it being a very reliable, very hard-hitting, and despite needing to be reloaded, once a few bugs have been worked out, fairly easy to reload weapon, give it a very high score in terms of pros. The only real con for the 40mm Bofors was that initial adaptation to mass production, like with the 20mm Orlikon, was a little bit finicky and did take a bit longer than with the 20mm Orlikon. However, once that was done, it also entered mass production and proved to be a very lethal, very capable weapon. So with a score of 7.6, the 40mm Bofors is the best widespread medium anti-aircraft weapon. And now we come to heavy anti-aircraft weapons, and unfortunately this is the biggest category by a considerable margin. Um, granted, it's largely that way thanks to the UK, with its near infinite variety of uh, heavy anti-aircraft weapons, which really doesn't help matters, but it is still a pretty... Uh, interesting category to look at. So again, we will go through all of these and every country has a, an entry, or well actually every country has at least two entries into this uh, system. So let's see how they all stack up. So for this wide field I've divided the guns up into four general groupings. First grouping, the guns that are, to be honest pretty poor. Um, guns you don't really want to have as your heavy anti-aircraft weapons. Then you've got guns that are serviceable, but still not anything to write home about. Then you've got guns that are pretty solid, guns that you'd be fairly happy defending yourself with. And then the final categorization, which is the guns that you really, really want. And of course, within that will be the ultimate winner as well. So in the lowest category, uh, guns you really, really don't want with scores just over about 3 out of 10, the absolute worst is the Japanese 120mm 45 caliber weapon. It has the worst rate of fire. Its weight of shell is middling. Its overall r amount of uh, firepower put down range, therefore, is really quite close to the bottom. It's got a, a decent-ish range, and its muzzle velocity is likewise middle of the par pack. For a much older design compared to some, it's got a fairly decent elevation, uh, but the muzzle velocity is actually fairly unreliable, and that low rate of fire really doesn't help. I mean, heavy anti-aircraft guns are not going to have the world's best rate of fire anyway, um, but this thing barely manages just over one shot every 10 seconds, which means that in certain types of attack profile it may only get off one or two rounds before the enemy attack is done. Then, kind of all scoring about the same, you've got the Japanese 127mm 40 caliber weapon. It's Well, it can shoot an extra round per minute faster so than the 120, so not particularly great there. It's got a very slightly heavier shell, obviously it's a 7mm greater calibre, um, and therefore its overall weight of fire is slightly higher. It actually has a slightly shorter range, but it, that's still middle of the pack, but its muzzle velocity is quite close to the bottom. On the plus side, it does actually come with an anti-submarine round, which makes it a little bit more versatile, allowing it to engage surface, subsurface and aircraft targets, and it trains pretty well but that lower range and lower muzzle velocity really do let it down. 
You've also got the Italian 100mm uh, 47 caliber weapon. This manages a mighty 9 rounds per minute, so again, st still in the uh, basement as far as rate of fire goes. The shell is pretty light, and as a result it has almost the worst um, a actual amount of firepower put down range per minute. It's got a middling range and a middling muzzle velocity. The plus side, it can load at all angles. It doesn't have to wind itself down for to accept a new shell, which some of the other guns in this category do. But the flip side to that is that its elevation speed is actually pretty poor. The final entry in the uh, list of heavy anti-aircraft guns you really do not want to have aboard your ship is the British 4.7 50 caliber, 4.7 inch I should say, 50 caliber Mark 12. It's got a relatively decent rate of fire, not still not really in the average, but better than the others at 11 rounds per minute. It's got a middle of the road uh, shell weight, and so its amount of firepower downrange per minute is okay. It's not quite average, but getting there. It does, however, have the worst range as an anti-aircraft weapon of any of the uh, ones on under consideration here although it does have a, a middling uh, muzzle velocity on the plus side it is an excellent dual purpose weapon in the anti-surface role um, but as an anti-aircraft weapon it trains very fairly slowly and the big weakness the reason why it has such an awful anti-aircraft ceiling is it has a very limited elevation. So that puts it down here with the others. If it hadn't had that limited elevation, then it probably would have moved up at least one cap, one tier. Um, but it didn't, so here we are. Now moving into the serviceable, but nothing to particularly write home about weapons, we start with the UK's 4-inch 45 Mark V and Mark 15 gun, which has a decent-ish rate of fire, slightly above average. The weight of the shell, however, is fairly light for this category, resulting in an overall fairly low amount of uh, shells per minute put down range in terms of overall weight. The range is okay, uh, the muzzle velocity is relatively poor. On the plus side, it does have fixed ammunition, which makes it much easier to fire than some other larger weapons in this category, which have two-part ammunition. But overall, it's just a somewhat dated weapon by World War II. Um, so it's it's an okay weapon, certainly better than the ones we were just looking at, but still nothing particularly fantastic. Next, we have America's 3-inch 50 caliber weapon. Now, this just about scrapes in as a heavy AA gunner with 76.2 millimeters. It's got a very good rate of fire, one of the highest in fact. The flip side being just about scraping in into the heavy category, its projectile weight is pretty poor, and that results in it also having the worst total amount of weight of fire put down range per minute. It's got an okay-ish range and a middle of the pack muzzle velocity now on the plus side it's combination of very light weight for a heavy anti-aircraft weapon as well as relatively decent hitting power because it is still a heavy weapon as opposed to a medium weapon made it very handy as an anti-aircraft weapon to equip on destroyer escorts and submarines but on the negative side to actually be a effective aa system it really ended up needing the later war fire control systems with radar integration to actually be effective. Otherwise, it was too, really too light to be used as an anti-surface weapon, and it was a little bit too slow um, for, a, for a borderline medium to heavy anti-aircraft weapon. It was faster in tracking and training than some of the really heavy stuff, but for a 3-inch gun, it should really be moving a little bit quicker. The irony, of course, being that a 3-inch gun turned out to be a near-perfect anti-aircraft weapon immediately post-war, but for the majority of the wartime period, it, it wasn't really quite there. Then we have the UK's 4.7-inch 40 caliber Mark 8 gun. 
This doesn't have the world's best rate of fire by a considerable amount. It's got a acceptable shell weight and so a somewhat below average weight of fire per minute. It's got an average range and a fairly poor muzzle velocity. It is an older weapon and as an older weapon it's not particularly awful for the period. It is power rammed um, so it can maintain its rate of fire at high elevations which is good but the weight of the ammunition um, did to degrade the ability of the crews to load it quickly because this was still using um, in, in significant numbers of mountings fixed ammunition so the higher weight of shells that you find in some other guns involved two-part ammunition which was actually easier to handle so yeah okay but uh, as I said not particularly brilliant then we have the Italian 90mm 50 caliber weapon it's got an okay rate of fire it's got a fairly light shell shouldn't be too surprising considering that along with the three inch um, it's one of the relatively few guns here that's below 100 millimeters and as a result it actually has a pretty poor weight of fire down range it does have a reasonable range though and a reasonable muzzle velocity slightly above average in both cases but not again anything particularly to write home about in a lot of ways, the gun is actually relatively good. It's got very good ballistics for its size. Uh, as a 90mm weapon, it actually outranges and fires with a higher muzzle velocity than some weapons considerably bigger than it. It's also very accurate and quite powerful once it's been issued with shells that were developed in the later war period when its stabilisation systems actually worked. On the negative side, the ammunition it was issued with earlier in the war had a fairly low burst radius which didn't help and the stabilization system broke down an awful lot which didn't help at all especially considering this was one of the heaviest anti-aircraft batteries and indeed the main anti-aircraft battery on things like the Latorios so that kind of brings it down into this category of overall okay but nothing particularly to write home about basically it was it was very good when it worked it just didn't work very often um slightly above it by 0.1 with a score of 4.4 the japanese 127 millimeter 50 caliber weapon it's got a pretty awful rate of fire to be perfectly honest but pushing towards the upper end of uh calibers here it has a reasonably weighty shell behind it it's got a not particularly brilliant amount of firepower put down range per minute though because of that very low rate of fire but the range and muzzle velocity on the gun are actually pretty good um, pushing up into very good categories it also as with a number of other japanese guns comes with an anti-submarine warfare shell enabling it to engage in all three spectra and uh, that range is, is pretty pretty solid a couple of big downsides though it's fairly slow to train and it has to, if it's engaging high threats, it has to wind itself down to 10 degrees in order to reload, which really doesn't help matters. And topping out this particular category is the German 105mm 45 caliber length C32 weapon, which has actually got a pretty decent rate of fire, um, but at 15 rounds per minute, but at the same time one of the lighter shells resulting in overall not particularly great amount of weight per minute being thrown down range it's got an okay-ish range overall and its uh, muzzle velocity is not anything particularly brilliant really that long range along with the high rate of fires it's only real um, significant pros but the muzzle velocity being fairly low means that those shells are actually going to take a significant amount of time to actually get there which means that actually tracking in on something is a little bit more of a task than it is on some of the other guns in this uh, heavy a gun category now we enter the realm of anti-aircraft guns that are actually pretty good pretty useful and uh so things that you would be fairly happy to see equipped on your ships uh, at the bottom of this particular category is the American 5-inch 25 caliber weapon. It has one of the best rates of fire. It has a 
pretty decent uh, shell weight, and that overall means that there's an awful lot of shell weight going down range. It's not, however, got the world's best overall range, and its muzzle velocity, as you might expect from a 25 caliber length weapon, is pretty abysmal. In fact, it's the worst of the heavy anti-aircraft one get guns. Now, for their size as a 5-inch weapon, because of this relatively short barrel, they're very fast training for that size. And of course, being a 5-inch gun, the power of the shell itself is pretty high. The mounting itself is also relatively light, which means you can equip a fair number of them if you want to. But the low muzzle velocity and subsequent low range means that whilst it's a 5-inch weapon, it really is a anti-aircraft weapon only. Using it in a surface action, if your enemy has something of the approximately the same kind of caliber, is a recipe for disaster. Now, granted, as a anti-aircraft weapon, that particular issue is less of an issue because, well, aircraft aren't ships, but considering that pretty much all of these guns would be used in a dual-purpose role, it does affect the quality of the weapon as a whole. Next up, we have the German 105mm 45 caliber C33 weapon. This, again, has a pretty good rate of fire, but a relatively light shell, resulting in a average, slightly below average amount of firepower per minute. It's got a pretty good range and a pretty good muzzle velocity, which stand in good stead, but as with uh, the other German and heavy anti-aircraft weapons, in the 105mm category, that's the main strength of it. It is, however, somewhat slow to train, and whilst it has a relatively complicated mounting, the mounting keeps breaking, which really, again, doesn't help because you can't shoot at things that your mounting won't let you aim at. But when the mounting worked, it's a pretty serviceable weapon. Then we have the UK's 4-inch 45 caliber weapon with the Mark 16 and Mark 21 types. This has a pretty good rate of fire, actually, one of the best at 17.5 rounds per minute average. The overall shell weight is pretty low, though, which means that despite that high rate of fire, the amount of shells and the weight of shells put down range per minute is not particularly great. It's not particularly bad, it's pretty much dead even on the average, but uh, it is let down a bit by that light weight of shell. It does, however, have a pretty decent range and a sort of average muzzle velocity. As a weapon, it's a pretty light one, so it's fairly easy to install. You can get quite a lot of them, and the range is comparable to the US 5-inch 38 caliber weapon. On the other hand, it's not the world's most accurate weapon, nor is it the world's most long-lasting weapon, and the shell being somewhat light means that in a dual-purpose role, it's not particularly brilliant. But as an anti-aircraft weapon, it's, it's not, not the bad at all. Then we have the UK's 5.25-inch 50 caliber weapon in its Mark I form. So this is the weapon found on things like the Dido class and the King George V class. Its rate of fire, make no bones about it, is pretty poor. Um, it's one of the lowest rates of fire of all the heavy anti-aircraft weapons. The flip side is that the uh, shells that it fires are by far the heaviest, which in turn means that its overall weight of fire downrange per minute is actually on average, compared to a lot of others. It also has the best range of any of the guns on this table, by a fair margin, although the muzzle velocity is slightly below average. So overall on the pro side, it has a very high anti-aircraft ceiling and long range, and when equipped with radar-guided fire control, this made it very accurate in its late war configurations. Indeed, in the Pacific War, once the Japanese had gotten used to the anti-aircraft bubble of the 5-inch 38, they were rather worryingly surprised by the 5.25-inch when it showed up with the British Pacific Fleet, which was able to almost snipe Japanese aircraft out of the air as they circled in an area that they thought was just about safe. But that low rate of fire and the fairly heavy ammunition that it used along with a cramped mounting in the Mark I variants, as opposed to the slightly 
better and more spacious mountings used on Vanguard mean that there's some fairly heavy negatives for the 5.25 as well. So that leads it with to have an overall score of 5.7. And the final gun in this uh, category is a relatively light weapon, the German 88mm 78 caliber C31. This has a very good rate of fire, but a very light shell, almost the complete inverse of the 5.25. But uh, the weight of shell is, is so light that the amount of the weight of fire going down range is pretty pretty poor. On the other hand, despite being such a small weapon, it has a very good range and a very good muzzle velocity. It's also one of the guns whose stabilization systems actually work pretty well. The flip side is that to get a range and muzzle velocity that compete with some of the best in the heavy anti-aircraft category when it is such a small gun means that its barrel life is pretty pr short. <laughs> They're putting an awful lot of energy through a gun that really doesn't appreciate it. Uh, but still, with an overall score of 5.9, this is the top end weapon in the decent good weapons, but not uh, crown taking. And so lastly, we come to the four weapons that, at least by my estimate, are represent the some of the best heavy anti-aircraft systems in existence during the bulk of World War II. At the lowest end of this category is the 88C31 successor, the 88mm 76 caliber C32 weapon. It has exactly the same rate of fire and shell weight and therefore shells downrange as the C31 weapon. It actually has a fractionally shorter range um, and the same muzzle velocity. So you might be thinking, well, hang on a minute, if it's pretty much a C31, but just with a slightly shorter range, why is it higher on the list? Well, it's got all of the pluses of the C31 with a very slight minus, but the barrel life is much much longer, um, which is quite a considerable advantage if you're going to be under prolonged air attack, and that pushes it over. To be fair, the uh, C31 scoring 5.9, the C32 only scoring 6.0, but it just just does, just about puts it over into the top category. The downside is that the 88 is generally found as part of a double caliber heavy anti-aircraft battery usually paired with 105s which means that you actually end up on most german large ships with four different anti-aircraft systems a 20 millimeter of some variant a 37 millimeter of some variant then the 88s and then the 105s which means that every individual battery is not as large as it could be which brings the score down a little bit in third place, pulling away somewhat with a score of 6.3, is the UK's 4.5 inch 45 calibre weapon, uh, seen quite commonly on British armoured carriers in the wonderful, what I tend to call, frying pan mounting, and also found on things like Renown, Queen Elizabeth and Valiant, the modernised British vessels. This does well in most categories. It's got a pretty decent rate of fire. It's got a above average weight of shell and as a result its amount of firepower downrange per minute is up there amongst the top. It's got a pretty good range. Um, it's got uh, 12,500 meters anti-aircraft ceiling which puts it quite quite a way up there. Its only real downside is that the muzzle velocity is actually pretty low. So overall its long range means that it's actually pretty good for dual purpose uses and the shell is pretty powerful um, when it comes to actually exploding and doing damage to all sorts of wonderful targets. The downside is that various issues with the ammunition could slow your rate of fire over time um, and that's why it's not taking the crown, it has to settle for bronze. In second place, I'm getting the silver position, is, given the issues with the 25mm and some of the other um, heavy AA weapons, a surprise entry from Japan. This is the 100mm 65 caliber weapon. It has one of the best rates of fire at 18 rounds per minute. 
its shell weight is not particularly great. I mean, it's 100 millimeter weapon. It's competing with 120 and 127 millimeters um, overall, so that's not particularly surprising. And so the overall rate of uh, or weight of fire downrange is not particularly great. It does, however, still have a very good range, a slightly longer range than the 4.5 inch, and it's got the highest muzzle velocity of any weapon in this category, which means that the shell is going to arrive on target pretty darn quickly. It also has all angle loading, very fast training, the high muzzle velocity we mentioned, good rate of fire, very good range, and it's actually fairly light for its overall performance. So absolutely superb weapon. Only real downside is has a very low barrel life. Like the German 88mm there, it's pushing an awful lot out of a fairly light weapon and as a result it erodes through the actual gun barrel pretty quickly. So with a score of 7.2, uh, the Japanese 100mm gun takes second place and really the Japanese could have used an awful lot more of them but it was a relatively new weapon at the time and so there were an awful lot more 120-127 millimeters taking up the Japanese heavy anti-aircraft slots on most ships. And then coming in taking the crown with first place with an overall score of 7.5 out of 10 is the American 5 inch 38 caliber weapon. Again probably not a great surprise. It's got the best rate of fire of any of the guns under consideration. The shell weight is a little bit above average, and that combines to give it the best rate, uh, weight of fire going down range per minute. Um, almost half a ton of shells actually going down range per minute per gun. It also has a pretty decent range, not the best, but well above average, and its only real weakness is a slightly below average muzzle velocity, but it's still got a slightly higher muzzle velocity as compared to some of the other guns in this particular top tier category, such as the 4.5 inch. Now, other pros with the 5 inch 38 caliber weapon, it pretty much addressed all of the issues with the 5 inch 25 without sacrificing many or, or any of the benefits. It was an incredibly reliable weapon, and its rate of fire, despite being one of the big guns in this uh, particular category uh, with its caliber, is a massive mark in favor. The only real downside of this particular weapon is that the 38 caliber length barrel means that it has a slightly shorter range than other comparable weapons, and is slightly less effective in surface actions or at extreme range. Um, the Combined with the lower muzzle velocity obviously this means that the overall outer envelope of lethality was somewhat less than some of the other weapons we've discussed earlier like the 5.25, but once you got inside that radius you were probably going to be in a fair bit of trouble. So there you go. Now of course there are other issues that you could consider, as I said at the beginning of the video, things such as uh, how available was the gun, how many of them were there, uh, the particular strengths and weaknesses of any particular given mounting, uh, which, I mean, that, that will affect the individual capabilities of particular ships, but, again, in this video we're looking at the mo more common mountings, and we're looking more at the capabilities of the gun itself, uh, which is why some of the side issues around, particularly around mountings, are in the, the slightly more nebulous categories of pros and cons, and therefore only really come into consideration when they're particularly good or particularly awful. So that is a just about hour-long rundown of the strengths, weaknesses, and uh, suitabilities of the most common at heavy, medium, and light anti-aircraft weapons used in the various navies of the Second World War, the five largest navies. Hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments what you think, and uh, if there's a particularly strong swell of opinion that would like to hear about things like the rocket launchers and the anti-aircraft weapons of the Russian, French, Dutch, and other navies, then I might consider doing one of those in the future as well. But for now, thank you very much for watching. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below.
Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.